Spend more time in the office for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, DCF seminar, the Visual Computing Forum. Uh, my name is Nuska Smith. If we've not met before, I'm an associate professor in the Visualization Research Group. Uh, today, it is my pleasure to announce our speaker, Mohamed Khalil. He is a senior researcher of learning analytics at the Center for the Science of Learning and Technology, also known as SLATE, which is part of the Department of Psychology. But interestingly, he just told me they don't uh, employ many psychologists there. Yeah. <laughs> no, computer so, science. More computer scientists than psychology there. So that's quite interesting. Um, his research interests focus on the understanding of online learning behavior based on students' digital traces in virtual environments. Uh, and additionally, also researchers privacy and ethics and also a bit of visualization. He has authored well, over, right. yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been told. <laughs> he authored over uh, 70 research papers uh, and he publishes regularly in journals such as uh, Journal on Learning Analytics and Technology uh, and how to learn. <laughs> yes, uh, we're really looking forward to your talk. So uh, welcome and thanks for accepting our invitation. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Okay. okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for the invitation. And we have been actually thinking of making it virtual uh, because I'm a bit sick, so please excuse me for uh, my red eyes and also uh, yeah, my voice is a bit strange. But it's, it's not COVID, so don't worry about that. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I was thinking about like what to what to talk about here at the uh, virtual community forum. And it's actually, I, I, I thought that you know, changing, exchanging educational data into virtuals maybe might be of interest. So I'll talk a little bit about the field of learning analytics where it's a very interesting new field. And I think it's worth for the others to know what it's about. And it, of course it has strong connections to, uh, to visual engines and how we can drive that forward. <clears throat> So Nuska introduced me, but uh, shortly uh, I got my PhD from Graz University of Technology from Austria uh, through a scholarship. Uh, I'm originally from Jordan in the Middle East. And then after that, I did a postdoc at uh, Delft University of Technology. Uh, I also worked in the Alliance of Erasmus, uh, Rotterdam, and Leiden University and Delft University of Technology, and worked also on online uh, learning. And now I'm a senior researcher at the University of Bergen at the Center for Science of Learning and Technology, Slate. So this is Slate. We are moving to C12 as president as well. It's very unfortunate. We really didn't want that, but the other one is fifth. And that will be on the fifth. Yeah. yeah. So this is Slate. This is the Center for Science of Learning and Technology. And we have actually many projects here. Uh, we really uh, investigate a lot of uh, what is learning analytics, how we improve learning experience, not only in higher education, but also at schools. And then when Noska asked me, like, when, when you guys get the funding, I was not there, I was not employed there, but how we sustain the funding, then we get it from, you know, uh, more projects and, you know, that, and then once you get the money, they say, once you get the money, you keep getting it. So, uh, so we have actually many, many, uh, projects, but mainly we have a couple of themes. Uh, one of them, the main thing is learning analytics, which is why the, uh, the government and the University of Berkeley funded the center. And also we have creativity learning technology. We have more, uh, we have also another thing about assessment, but it's all really uh, related to the field of learning analytics. And uh, our developer also made uh, some kind of a network between all the projects we have. Uh, here you see it's mainly about learning analytics. We have a lot of different uh, projects that are funded by the European Union and also by the NFR, by the university, and most of them are very much connected to learning analytics. Feel free to uh, to use the um, uh, sorry to enter the slate website and you will find a lot about the projects we have here. And we are also there for collaboration, of course. <clears throat> so. How did we end up here, me and Noska, uh, through a uh, uh, collaboration? So this is a picture we got from a proposal we sent called Scale It to Eco, I think, for Center for Excellence. And I'm here. And uh, it was actually very interesting uh, proposal, but fortunately it was not funded. 
uh, but hopefully David will push it somehow and send it again. <laughs> yes. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I think the slide comes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So let's get into the topic. So we know, you know, we now live in uh, in a world where technology is really uh, uh, is the mainstream of of nearly everything. So you know is that uh, we use our mobile systems, we use our iPads, um, iPhones, blah blah blah, all these smartphones, and now like the new technologies, drones, etc. So most of these systems really generate a huge amount of data. And uh, very interesting uh, is that um, how the, uh, the field of learning starts is, uh, is a term called digital exhaust. You know, and like with digital exhaust, when we talk about that, it's like the car exhaust. But this time is that when we use all the digital systems, we leave behind us uh, uh, traces, you know? So, and these traces are really uh, exhaust that can be very valuable to be uh, processed and then we can, um, and, then, and then after that we can use this to improve what we are doing or to understand more things about it than, than people really realize about what they are doing, especially in the education stream. And interestingly is that uh, there are a lot of exaggerate, uh, exaggeration about, about the data is the new oil, and also data becomes very valuable. But recently, I think this is not very true because the most important thing is, is the gas now in Europe, you know, everyone's talking about this. And um, uh, this is like, you know, this is a slide that I got from before about data as a new oil and et cetera. But actually, yeah, I think for now, energy is more important for us than data. Anyway, yes, so. So data are everywhere, and you know when we when we have this data that is raw that uh, that we need to process them, then we can transfer things from, as I said, from raw things not very advantages into something. This is actually a picture from my home. <clears throat> I'm very much into simulators, and I built a racing simulator uh, at my home. Uh, this is a picture of motors, and after that, after you know, working on this, then I got the motors very much installed in a clean way. And at the end, I have this at my house, at my home. It's a racing simulator. That's very, very time consuming, very interesting thing. But the idea is not, not about the race simulator, but it's actually about how transferring things can become very interesting at, at the end. So data, when it's raw, we then use it to make to make use of it, and that's through you know analytics. Then we are talking about data analytics, and the field of learning analytics is very simply when we are talking uh, in an educational stream. Then we then we talk about using this data about improving the experience that the students have. You know, is that now a lot of um, a lot of, of what we are using now in education is very much also related to technology and IT systems and uh, a lot of data generations. So in 2011, a field called learning analytics emerged and there, uh, you know, uh, a birth to a conference called learning analytics and knowledge conference, uh, talking about this field and now it has been since that time, now there's a journal of learning analytics and also the government of, uh, of, of Norway also investigate that and I will, <clears throat> and also invited a group to, uh, to study if learning analytics would be beneficial to the Norwegian system at schools and higher education. And I have one slide, I think, at the end that uh, I, I, uh, I will bring about uh, uh, how the government see learning analytics here in Norway and also in Europe. But yeah, so there are many definitions, but I find this one is very interesting and very easy to understand. It's the use of data about students and their activities to enhance education. Okay. And, you know, uh, one point is that this slide I got from um, uh, uh, a consultant that came from uh, a JISC, uh, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an organization in Scotland, and they look about the usage of students' data and how to improve education. And he said that universities in the old times, they have a lot of data, they have a lot of information about libraries, about students, but they never, but they never use that. And whenever they started to use that, then we're talking about learning analytics. And I will, of course, bring some examples of, of, of what kind of data learning analytics use and how it is currently, the current status of 
what can they use uh, out there. So that was a little introduction, but just like to let you know how what is the field and, and what kind of data they use. So what data? So <clears throat> a new uh, interesting um, uh, term that comes when they when they talk about data and learning analytics is mouse channel data, and we talk about uh, you know that when we use um, at like University of Michigan we have the campus system. There is also uh, MOOCs, the massive online courses, you know, Coursera, Dedex, stuff like that, and many other systems that uh, generate a lot of data. But I can talk to talk that one of the main um, uh, data types we use in learning is called, uh, is called Glitchstream data. That whenever you log in into the system, then that's preserved. Uh, whenever you do an assignment or you do something, that's you know that's somehow registered. And the field of learning analytics or researchers use that in order to get out uh, something like attendance information, uh, clustering, uh, comparing students to the others to, to see whether they want maybe they're, they're, they're uh, at risk of failing, uh, and etc. We also have some interesting points that when the field started, um, some researchers were using mass movement, trying to see if students are really active by looking at mass movement. <clears throat> we also have data about attendance whether students also join a university come to the university all this attendance data can also be used for learning analytics and you know there's a new sort of data as i previously uh, said which is like you know the multimodal stuff like eye tracking and uh, the other 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 sorts that i will show in the next slide we also have assessment to create like performance social media uh, natural language processing of uh, what students write and discussion forums, questionnaires and surveys. And these are only some examples of the sources of educational data that learning analytics can use in order to improve the learning experience of students. And uh, as I said, multimodal data, it's currently not really, I would say, it's only, it's only a prototype, you know? Um, I never saw this uh, really in action, except for China that I saw. They use cameras inside classes and they record what students do. But then we really clash into privacy and ethical uh, matters of using data. But it's very interesting when it's prototyping how students like eye gazing and you know the emotions they move, the the EEG, uh, yeah, many 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 sensors that can be actually very interesting to use in order to understand that. So the goals of uh, so the goals of using learning analytics uh, as a field uh, and the com uh, and the community behind that called Solar is a society of learning analytics research and they come up with many uh, goals but these are uh, some of them that are, I think they are the most interesting ones and uh, the first one is supporting student development for lifelong learning skills and strategies. Number two is using learning analytics provision of personalized and timely feedback, send feedback to students. And number three, supporting development of important skills, such as improving collaboration when they use virtual systems, online systems, or digitalized systems, plus critical thinking, the creativity and stuff like that. And also develop students' awareness. And that's part of the visualization dashboards that they are shown to teachers or students. And also, last but not least, supporting quality learning and teaching by providing critical evidence of the success of pedagogical uh, innovations and also uh, uh, technical uh, approaches. So, and then uh, <clears throat> um, for people like we're wondering uh, why do we need that? Why do we need learning analytics? Then uh, there has been a report in 2021, and they tried to foresee what is important for the current uh, education. And I find that they found that uh, these are the top six. One of them is, of course, artificial intelligence, is very important for education, and also uh, studies about blended and hybrid courses and learning analytics was like their number three. But there are more interesting themes that is uh, is also very important for the educational stream, such as micro credentials like giving certificates or uh, if you if you like for example uh, become a data scientist and you took that course for three months then that's uh, very important how we can uh, make that uh, a credential certificate as part of it and also OER open education resources making things open <clears throat> and also quality of my learning but yeah most important thing is they see at the right of the is called uh, is uh, placing learning analytics in the top 
uh, five on the top six of the future of uh, educational technology and using technology and learning and improving that. So four TWs that I was thinking maybe will be interesting for this uh, uh, presentation is that where does learning analytics originate from? What theories influence the field? And how does it improve, uh, promote uh, useful practices through visuals? And also what concerns are implied when we use them in analytics? And question number one is where does it originate from? And as I stated before, is that it, it starts from the term of distance learning, distance education. Very interesting is that uh, distance education is not only, I think it's only virtual, but also in large classrooms when the teacher is presenting uh, his lecture and the students at the end, you know, yeah, there's a distance between the teacher and the student and they really like that attention. So it really started from uh, improve, uh, including technology in learning, the distance education, all these uh, formats of new learning. So it's, it, it really starts from there. And as well as we see a lot of attention now to the field and also to technology enhanced learning after the COVID-19. And that's very much pushed by, by you know, the uh, World Economic Forum, uh, Forum, the World Bank, and you know, many uh, other uh, popular um, uh, organizations uh, and uh, forums that <coughs> that uh, uh, highlight the value of, of of online education. And that was really part of of, of using that for learning analytics and how it pushes the field uh, in the forefront. And when we talk really about learning analytics and what is really the difference between when we say like data analytics and learning analytics, what is the big difference is that what is nice about learning analytics is that it includes more disciplines than only computer science or statistics. So uh, through different literature reviews in the field, they find that statistics is very important. They find uh, economics and computer science is as important as the others. Psychology, pedagogy, education. And this is very important. And uh, especially that uh, there has been many discussions about well, what is the difference as well between learning analytics and data analytics is that data analytics most likely doesn't involve theories and theories from education, but with the involvement of learning theories, then it becomes a different stream uh, of, of using data analytics and becomes learning uh, analytics. And through a study that I did on Twitter, we tried to look at uh, where learning analytics uh, uh, tweets and talks is it's, it's, it's really about. And uh, very interesting that we found that uh, most likely it's from the global north. And it, it really, it, it's still, there are still a lot of time for the others in Asia and in, in Africa to, 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 to really to carry on with what's happening. Unfortunately, in India, when we looked at what it was mostly bots, you know, social bots. They use a lot of bots of free tweeting and stuff. So we found that, but yeah, I just wanted to show that on, on a map uh, for the field. But uh, it's, as you see here, it's really uh, very much caring about the field and also USA and some parts of, of, of other areas of, of the world. And using also the tweets that, that, that study, we also wanted to see what are the main things that are, that are discussed in, in the field. We saw that you know uh, social media themes is there very much appearing, especially after 2020, because most likely because of the COVID, we see discussion about security, of course, education, uh, information explanation, like you know, conferences, machine learning and stuff. But what is interesting that we found about the field, unfortunately, that we think that while learning analytics was mainly about education and learning, which is here the orange theme, we found that the tweets are really becomes less and less uh, by the time. And I think the focus becomes more on machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, data analytics, and they nearly forget uh, that learning analytics is about learning. Learning analytics is about education. And uh, that was, uh, the, the, this only one evidence from Twitter, but maybe this, the literature also uh, can confirm that uh, from the studies that are available in the, um, uh, in the current literature that we found that many articles talk about the absence of theories more and more in the studies, which is, uh, I think, uh, a yellow or, or a red flag that the field and the community should, should care for this. Yeah, so back again to, <clears throat> to where 
to where we find that the field and you know the the back and forth between computer science and all and all disciplines and uh, this is you know from the squid game and uh, I use that in uh, some of my slides but it's very interesting that people from computer science always yeah well yeah this is our field we always do more than you guys than the others from pedagogy and education but as I said it's what is interesting about about, about the field is the mix between uh, computer science and uh, and many other streams of education and other disciplines like learning and education, pedagogy and uh, statistics. Yeah, so back to 2015 here, when I uh, first started my PhD and I wanted to see how learning analytics starts, what, how, yeah, what is a general framework for that? And I find by summarizing over, I think, 200 papers, is that learning analytics start by a learning environment that that can be online learning environment or can be in a physical uh, uh, class and then the most important thing is the learners and the learners after that create data and this really should not be only big data but, but also small data is as important as big data and after that we take the data from here process it to become analytics and the analytics then we can do some kind of actions and these actions can be prediction for students can be uh, uh, can be interventions to help students who might be at risk. Also, recommendation like recommending the courses, uh, and etc. And at the end, usually closing this loop can be by optimizing the learning environment, optimizing the learning experience that the students have. So, what theories influence the field? As I said, is that the nice difference between learning analytics and well, data analytics is involving theories and a very nice quote that I find that maybe it's also can be applied to visual uh, forms that I like this. It says research without theory is blind and theory without research is empty. Okay, so we find that very motivating for us to do our scoping review at, 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 at looking at what theories involve the field and yeah, looking at the numbers here, looking at the conference and the journals, we come up with 71 studies that talk about the field plus theories and we find that there are many theories from education but mainly the one of called self regulated learning i don't know if some of you heard of that but it's a theory that's really very much used in the field and some of these like learning analysis and then after that we see some uh, theories like constructivism predictivism the theory and yeah many other also theories that some, some of them I, I really don't understand but yeah it's that like there's a, 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 some um, uh, some theories that are more uh, prominent than the others, especially the self regulated learning theory. And then we looked uh, in the study, we wanted to see what theories have been used and across the years, you know, the, uh, the x axis is the years and the y axis is the, the number of studies. And we find that self regulated learning, as I said, is really on the uh, assembly, uh, sorry, and cognitive theory has been. Uh, more uh, uh, more popular in recent years. Plus, you can see some theories have been in the discussion and in, in, in the illustrations of the field, and after that, they just disappear, like the constructivism, network learning, like popping up and trying again. So, self determination theory as well, uh, and uh, the other uh, theories here. But what we concluded is that learning analytics include theories from a range of disciplines. Uh, so we confirmed that and number uh, and the other uh, conclusion is that we find that self learning is really the main theory that has been used uh, for learning analytics. So the more interesting part here, I think, is that how does it promote useful practice to individuals? And here I will try to bring some examples from the field. And uh, I think one of the examples is also a tool that we developed at Atomos. So visuals. <clears throat> becomes very important. We see that in the cars, we see that everywhere, and also we see that in uh, smart devices, as I said. And very interesting when I prepared uh, my first slide about visualization uh, for uh, for my class, uh, for a beach students and the learning analytics, I find, I find this, and it was really very interesting that uh, it says here, they measure, they measure, I think the CO, CO2 or you know the gases it, it gets out through visualization 
and they somehow mentioned that maybe you guys know more about uh, more than me about what, what was very interesting how digitalization has been very much you know uh, very much uh, developed and, and, and you know, especially like this example here uh, that they measure how much gases uh, factories can uh, can exhaust from uh, from their uh, factories but yeah so visuals usually <clears throat> visuals are not only you know dashboards and stuff but also can be textual so this is one of the early examples of normal analytics and this is a student that it is simulator as as a surgeon they use here a tool as you can see here uh, like this one and like when they use that pen they try to drill the bone and when they drill the bone then the system can get can give you feedback like for example here it says you are too tentative for this stage of the procedure and please apply more force okay so that was one of the first examples that they use learning analytics and data behind it in order to send feedback to the students so instead of someone as the, the trainer is that like to stand behind this, the students you have to push more in the system itself can give uh, instant feedback to the students using the data they use that was the first example <laughs> The second example is from Delft University of Technology, some colleagues, is that this is a dashboard. And the dashboard here shows the student uh, performance and the student's data in comparison to the current students and also in comparison to the previous graduates. And here, it can compare here, uh, you know, uh, six variables, like the average time per week the students spend, the how much time they, revis they revisit a video lecture, Picture, how much time they contribute or like how much input they contribute to the discussion forums, the quiz questions, portion of time spent on quizzes, etc. And then the, the blue area here is yourself, it's the student, and here's the average last week, and also they can also choose if they want to compare themselves to the students from previous times. <clears throat> and the researcher here also, they took that also further by providing as well instant feedback to the student, students who are on track and students who are behind. Students who are on average like the same students as now, they provide some certain messages using two theories, one called individual state promo uh, promotion, the other one is collectivist, it's like two uh, theories. And when they are behind, then they tell the student what to do as a message that they are sending. So try, they try to push the students if they are lagging behind, if they are lagging behind to do something in order to improve the learning experience. And that's all using the online system of, of data. <clears throat> a second, <clears throat> another example here is from Pridespace, it's similar to Canvas. It's also another tool here. And based on the data that they leave behind, whether they succeed in some courses, whether they fail in the other courses, then the system recommends courses for the students. Okay, if you are very good in visualization, then I, then the system can recommend you to take visualization too, or advanced topics of visualization, or like machine learning and you know R and visualization. So the system knows whether you succeed or fail by giving you some recommendation, and this really can get more uh, interesting when uh, when the guys from and uh, researchers from the recommendation stream will be involved. And that's what is nice about learning analytics, I think, is that it involves other disciplines like computer scientists, like the people from the recommendation systems, they can be of really invaluable help for the, the field here. <clears throat> Very interesting example also from 2012 is a, is, is a tool called Core Signals. So Core Signals, as you can see, is like the traffic signals. You see here the red, yellow, and green. And this is a view for the advisors, and this is developed at Purdue University in USA. So what the advisors see, they see the student names. And whenever there is a red light, that means that there is a risk about the student. And when they are green, then things seem okay with the students. And when they are yellow, there is maybe something suspicious about the student, you know, progress. And what we saw in the literature and what the researchers behind this tool uh, said is that when the advisors see a red color for like uh, Angela, they could invite her for a talk because she is, there's a problem she might fail in the future. So they invite her, they do some sort of intervention. Uh, the teacher could send a message to the student, hey, I see that you're lagging behind in my course. 
So there might be a problem. In order for you not to fail, maybe you have to do this and that. And that's very critical for, uh, for some universities because dropping out might lose a lot of money. And I know the Norwegian system here is that the student can take three years, but if they drop in the fourth year, the university just lose money. Okay, so it's very important as well for the faculties. So in the study, uh, there they found a couple of interesting uh, results. They found that problems were identified in the second week of the semester, and also some sort of interventions that could drive advice for teachers, like posting a signal on students' homepage. Is you get a notification. Uh, so the other intervention is emailing the students or texting them, or even arranging a meeting. And also they found that the courses that deploy this tool, they see better grades for the students because there's more uh, communication between the lecturer or the advisor and the students. And also what they found is that students of Signal seek help earlier and more frequently. This is very important. That usually students, when, when they are in, you know, in large classes or in virtual spaces, then they may be uh, shy to ask for help and so, but th this tool has show that students can seek earlier uh, the the other tool that here the other example is is from slate uh, we developed this tool is for uh in a collaboration with Oslo university they offered the course there and they asked us can we can we use learning analytics can you help us with this we well, we heard about the field can you help us we don't know what's going on in the course so we offered them some statistics showing everything in the courses and like how much time the students spend, whether they are spent it in the morning, whether they spend it in the afternoon. And, uh, you know, such information could be very helpful for the instructors. Uh, but also they asked us, what can we do more with the data? Okay, you showed us statistics, you showed us information, what can we do more? So we offered them that maybe we can show you also some lights. You see it's, it's here, very interesting that uh, the lights seems to be uh, very, important in this field, but we show them some colors like uh, uh, orange, green, and, and red, but also uh, you can send feedback to the student, you can do something. And then these, uh, these notification or feedback, you can, the teacher can, um, can develop this, can, uh, can put the text they want. And like, for example, here, uh, they can send a message right away. You have you been away for too long because your, your last activity here was from very long time, or we can call for a Zoom call or a follow-up incentives, whatever the, student, the, the teacher would really like to do, they are available for this. And yeah, we also get more funding for this for, the, for this project. So we might drive that into making automatic feedback, okay? That the system can send automatic feedback without the teacher being involved. So the teacher can involve everything else, like if the student is not coming for two weeks, then the system automatically send a message to the students. But we, have, we should be very careful about the ethical and you know, the mistakes that the systems can do. So it's very important that we tell the students that this is a prototyping and this is a research practice, just like uh, an example of what the future can be. Another example is called a tool called Threads. It's not from Slate, but it's from another uh, place. Uh, I can't remember. But it's about <clears throat> what the students are really discussing in their discussion forums. And this can also be applied not only in discussion forums like in Canvas or, or, or in um, uh, other learning systems, but also in Discord or Slack. And here, the, the teacher can really see how much interaction is happening between each student and the others. And then, you know, everything here is interactive using you know, all these rituals, uh, technology by hovering over students, by exchanging, making stuff like that. And then you can see who are uh, very much uh, isolated than the others, who is not talking, who is talking with the other, and then make something about this as well, making intervention. Because if you remember the framework that they showed, it's not only showing the information and stopping that, but no, there should be an intervention. There should be something after that, like interacting with the student or doing something with the system or just to, uh, to follow up on that. Another example is from the University of Michigan. And this is a warning, an early warning dashboard, and it shows to the advisor. Here you see the advisor here, and these the students' names. 
and then they see some kind of status here. And very interesting how, how they develop that. They develop these slides or they develop these warning lights uh, according to specific algorithm, so that if the student is scoring 85 and above, then everything is, you know, everything is okay. But not only stopping that the green light shows that students is okay, then I don't have to do anything, but maybe also encourage the students that, oh, you are doing very good, you may proceed with that, okay? So that's not only for students who are in the red area, but also the students who are doing well, that we also need, we need to keep them motivated. And then if they score less than 85, between 75 and 84, then uh, it, it gets into more things, like the difference from course average. If it's maybe yellow, it goes here, and then it maybe it goes here. And if the scores become less and less and less than the average, and you know, using percentile, then it can be into you need to engage the advisor to engage with the teacher to engage, or if you are in the mid range, that an exploration that the teacher or the advisor can explore what's happening. And you see here that in the systems of the USA, they rely a lot on advisors. But here in the Norwegian, uh, I don't see that often. So the teachers are more responsible to follow up on that. Okay, and another example is very interesting, 2022 study. This is from a Zoom, okay? We now a lot use Zooms in our uh, lectures, the instructors or the students. And what's interesting about this tool, it's called Zoom Sense. And it's a bot that joins the groups when the teachers split the groups. And this bot can know if the students are talking to each other, how much time they talk to each other, and, and, and then show this into this kind of dashboard. Okay. And then after that, the instructor, instead of going to each group and checking what's happening in each group, they can just look at the dashboard and they can see who is not collaborating, who is collaborating, you know, etc. And this is not only for Zoom, but they also involve it in uh, Google Documents because most likely when there are groups, then the students are asked to fill in, um, fill in uh, uh, you know, a Google document to share it with the student. So this tool is also following up on that. So I think here in group one, you see it's all inactive and it shows here a visualization that there's no interactions. Uh, group five is very active. And you see here that group five, student four is still student five, to student two, and this one is more likely to talk with student one student and uh, with the student two, it's more from student one to student two. How it record that, I'm not sure how, how it does this, but feel free to go to this tool, it's called Zoom Sense. It's very interesting. I think the last two things is that here, I find uh, also customizable dashboard, is that the students are asked, what kind of information do you want to see? Okay, and it, it, it gives you some options and the and then the students can choose what kind of variables they would like to see, how much time they start activities, how much time they did something, and you know, revision, etc. And then they get some kind of, uh, of, of, of a dashboard, but are very much also looking similar to the one from the Netherlands because the, the researchers where here is the same researchers from the other tool that I showed you, Spider Web, is that they also show, show, show this here in this uh, dashboard. That's 2021. The one that I showed was 2017. So there is more development to, to make customizable dashboards. Yeah. So, and then the last, uh, we're on time, right? Yes. I think uh, I need seven minutes or six minutes. Yes. Okay, and then the last question is that what concerns are implied when involving learning analytics? And of course, it's privacy. So, so, <clears throat> sorry. so here we see that learning analytics are becoming increasingly popular for improving learning, but critics question the impact of privacy. This is very important, and I have been looking into that since 2015, and there are many examples of, of what kind of threats are there for using students' data. And I found that framework in 2015 that I summarized them into seven uh, issues. One of them is privacy, the other one is accessibility, uh, transparency, uh, policy and security, accuracy of, of the information, restrictions, and the ownership of data. This is very important. But that was 2015. And in 2018, we, we heard of the uh, general data protection uh, rules, the GDPR. So things have been changing at, in, in that matter. 
And then the question is that we, we always wanted to ask is that, should we ask students for consent to take their data? Should we ask the students for consent to send them interventions? So we ask the students for consent if the teacher one of the advisors want to look at their data and compare the students to the others. That's a very interesting question. And I now have a PhD student who only looking into this. We want to see what's going on with that well, with that data. Yeah, and as I said, the GDPR has been here. A lot of things have been changing, a lot of consent. And the very interesting point about the GDPR is that the students can withdraw. So imagine that uh, th this is a challenging issue, is that for our fields, even individuals, imagine that you are making a visualization or a dashboard for a number of people. And then one of them is just say, hey, I want to withdraw. I don't want to be a participant anymore. So I want to delete all my data. So there should be more consideration of what's happening with the data. And here are new terms, new ideas are coming is something called privacy by design. So we always have to consider privacy before starting to design visualizations, you know, learning analytic systems or any other systems from computer science. And also talking about privacy and the issues, then we have kind of responsible learning analytics, very similar to responsible AI. And that is, you know, some terms like we have to be uh, answerable, reliable with what things, when things go wrong. We have to also be blameworthy, not fulfilling contractual things. We have to be transparent about that. Obligations, what can we do with frameworks of what's happening in the field? And we have to always act ethically and morally, be responsible to what we do, have obligations, duty to act, and be transparent about what we do. So that was <clears throat> nearly my presentation, and hopefully it was uh, just valuable for you to know what is what it's about and how it's related to some sort of visualization. And the question is that, what is next for learning analytics? And I'll just add this, a STEM collaboration. We should learn from, in our area, we should learn from people like you or from visualization who are more advanced than us in that area. We should learn from you and also from other fields. I think this is one uh, extension to the field. Number two is equitiveness. We usually rely on algorithms but we don't know if these algorithms are biased. We don't know if these algorithms consider people with disabilities. We don't consider if these algorithms or these dashboards consider people with some issues with like blindness, you know, and other issues of people. So we have to think about inclusiveness when we talk about uh, this field or other. Privacy by design should be reconsidered, as I said, because privacy is now very important. Ethical matters are very important and it should be reconsidered again. So the idea is not design and then involve privacy, but no, involve privacy and the data protection matters at the very early stages before designing and implementing. And of course, we need to follow what's happening. It's, it's artificial intelligence, and now it's the buzzword, you know, we we'll always have to go, hey, we have artificial intelligence here. At this tool. But I think it will be very interesting to involve learning analytics to, uh, to make the field uh, work at scale. It's like when you have uh, classes, when you have uh, groups that have hundreds, hundreds of students. So that one sending feedback will not be beneficial. We have to make some automation, right? So in order that this is to work. So in Norway, as I said, there has been a group uh, by the government uh, on an expert group. The director of Slate has, is in there. They already published a one report on that, and there will be another report. And then they want to see uh, they want to see how they can involve learning analytics in the future of education in Norway, the schools, and in universities. And what else we got? I got this project very much recently. It's an Erasmus Plus project. And it's about involving learning analytics in virtual labs. That was interesting. I had to get the money, but I was happy. We, all, we already sent a lot of uh, applications to NFR and all of them failed, but for Erasmus, it worked out. I'm happy for that. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, that's it for me. <laughs> Sorry, thank you so much, Mohammed.
So we're open for questions from the room. And the reason I hold my laptop is we also have some people on Zoom that have questions. And okay. I would like to start with the uh, questions from the room if we have them. Uh, first in the back, um, how did you get into learning analytics in the first place? Yeah, um, it was, as I said, uh, so I have a master's degree in uh, information security and privacy, but I have a bachelor in computer science. Mm -hmm. And then the scholarship, my supervisor said, hey, there's a new field for learning analytics. Will you be interested in that? And then I started to read on that and I found this very interesting. So and as I said, the different disciplines of the field made, made, made it interesting for me to be involved. Like people from education can be in there, psychologists, computer science. So I said, yeah, okay, we'll be in there. <laughs> yeah. You talk about a tool called Threads. You say that that worked with Discord. Uh, the, the, the tool called Threads? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it works, but it can be implied that, you know, uh, the discussion forums of, of learning management systems sometimes are dead. And they can take such tool to, in, to, to, be, to, to scrape text from uh, Slack or Discord and being uh, pushed into such tool like Thread. And I'm not quite sure if it takes that, but I think I read that Threads can be used with Slack and uh, other communication uh, tools like also WhatsApp or so. If not, there are, there are many other tools that can use this, which is totally okay. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. I have actually several questions, maybe to start with one. Uh, I would assume that the ultimate goal of all of this is to, to improve the learning uh, outcomes on the student side. So after like 10 plus years of learning analytics, what has proven to be the most effective in improving learning outcomes on the student side? Yeah, so that's of course very interesting and it has been always a question is that what is now the value? And I think is that what is now good for the field is that how we now understand what is happening in the online forums of you know of of education so for example is that there has been a lot of um, uh, discussion about what's happening in the courses especially uh, students who might be at risk so in the usa and in the uh, and in the uh, north america uh, uh, continent they care a lot about this and they found that learning analytics has been very helpful for them in order to identify students at risk. Could, could you be a bit more specific? I yeah. mean, if you would have like three recommendations for yeah. me, what to change in order to improve yeah. learning outcomes based on learning analytics? Yeah, so actually with learning analytics, you can evaluate as a teacher. As a teacher, you can evaluate your course based on what's happening. Is your is your uh, is your uh, teaching material is very beneficial based on what's happening and by by the students. So that can be a first part. The other thing is that students want to know more information about what they do. Okay, so whether they are uh, doing well as such with the other students using by looking at like for example visualizations and data. So that's another part. The other parts that I think of is that also how learning analytics can improve collaboration. Is that by making some sort of interventions, as I showed before, and that, that, and that has been proven. So it really depends very much on the stakeholders that involved in learning analytics as instructor or as faculty or as a learner. A learner, as you said, can improve collaboration, you can know more information about you. As an instructor, you can evaluate your course. As a faculty, they can look at you know, business-wise, what things are happening. Yeah. I'm sorry to be a little insistent on this. I mean, this is very fascinating. You showed a lot of what can yeah. be done. Yeah. But I try to understand what is most effective. I mean, there's a lot that can be done. That is quite obvious. Yeah. But what is most effective in, in terms of achieving improvements in learning outcomes of students? Well, it's, yeah, you know, is that, uh, it's just like it's just like open, you know. For us, for us, like from my own perspective, as like when we deploy the analytics for the master online course, students found the interventions that they get from teacher. They they don't feel isolated anymore. Okay, they get the messages from uh, from the teacher, so they don't feel that the online system makes uh, the uh, the isolated. Like the students feel they are more involved more uh, reachable by the teachers, the teachers are following up. So this is one of the survey results that we get from the students 
in the online system that I showed you before with the Oslo uh, universe. So that's that. So that's from my perspective. Other perspectives could be <clears throat> could also be that some of the many uh, uh, did not work for them. So I saw that, and 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 it has been proven. Like for example, mistaken algorithms or something like that. It didn't work out, and they had to improve it in some way. But for us, we saw that working at least in, in that project with Oslo. And we were happy about the results, and we also wanted to approve the feedback messages that we sent to the students. Yeah. I think a question from, I wanted to say Discord, but it be Zoom, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, David Grasha, who yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, David, yeah. is attending remotely today, yeah. and he has actually two questions. Okay. So you showed this uh, Twitter sort of heat map on the word learning analytics on Twitter, and where yeah. it would use that. And he asked us if that is language independent. Yes, uh, that was only yeah, thank you. Uh, that was only actually uh, limitations that we only looked at English. Uh, oh, yeah. yes. But we did not like, for example, look at uh, from Spanish or from uh, you know other 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 languages. Yeah. But we we looked at the tags of like using learning analytics. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, for this uh, system you developed for Oslo Math, yes, yeah. this sending feedback feature. How does this scale to a larger number of students? Yes, so uh, that's actually also a limitation, but we wanted to improve it and it, it's now in the process is that there will be multiple options for the teacher to select to send uh, to cohorts. So that, that for example, the uh, what we want to do is that the teacher can identify what messages they can send to what certain group, like for example, like for example, the students who are not uh, who have been absent for a long time, they can choose this. The system can identify who are these students and they can send a message to a group of them. Oh, yes. This is yes, this, this is, is our yes, yes. Yeah. And also they want us to implement automatic feedback, but I'm a bit uh you know, I'm a bit uh careful with this. Yeah. Yes, can I mention yes, yeah. yes. giving the wrong feedback? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, of course, devastating. Yeah. We have a third question. I see how they <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so one question um, that I have been wondering. In this regard, and the original is uh, the appropriateness of the data. Uh, I, I would expect that there's a, a little bit of a, a discrepancy between what is technically easy or feasible to acquire and what is expressive for the purpose you, you have in mind. I mean, a few measures you can relatively easily acquire. I don't know. The number of minutes is still yeah. uh, for just a video is easy to measure. Um, I don't know the, the improvement of insight on the student side would be maybe more interesting to measure, but it's much harder to to acquire. Yeah. How would you measure that, right? So I I was wondering whether you have derived some requirements or recommendations to system developers, say, or counselors or other yeah. teaching systems, of other measures to acquire, because they would be more expressive for yes. what you want to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we really heavily rely on the systems that generate these data, OK? So we have the data that comes from the system itself, and we have more, computer, uh, more, computer, sorry, more computerized variables that like for example calculated so for example the average time or something like this and we usually we usually have to first investigate what variables are available for us and what can be also beneficial for the end user of learning analytics so for example if the teacher then they have to look at yeah then we get some insights about uh, the teacher they want to see the time they spend or, uh, or whether they have been um, answering the uh, quizzes or the tasks correctly, so we can get that. But sometimes this information are not available from the system directly, so we have to make some sort of, you know, uh, merging data or getting the uh, available thing. And also, uh, when you said that, that was a very interesting point that we got is uh, calculating sessions. So sessions is very much uh, dependent on uh how we how we how we understand that so some sessions for example if a student look into a system 
and you know there has been an activity for a couple of seconds and then they leave the system for 10 minutes then we don't know if these 10 minutes the students are really doing something in the system or not so in this so in this case we just presume something we just presume that okay a session is a definition of 10 minutes and then we say that of course this could be wrong as well but like such examples we calculated by ourselves and we you know we advise you know just like we say that this is how the session is being calculated but it also can take that this can be also wrong. So it, it, it's really very much dependent on, 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 on how we on how we understand uh, what's happening in the system itself. So this is just like some examples that I that I remember for now. And also some other examples that's also from the discussion forums as well. It's like for example, usually uh, what is available is the time of a post or something and and like if you when a student click on a thread to see what's happening but also we look like deeper like what context is there make a translation of what's happening to show the teacher or the students uh collaboration features like we can also depend on whether there has been any messages before between the students and the other students so we come up with the new data types based on very raw data that we find in the systems uh, itself my question back. Um, you talked about um, placing um, the places of link or placing um, professor messages with automatic uh, automatic yeah. messages. Do you believe that those would be on the same level as a professor's message? Because I could see that automatic messages would be like kind of not uh, or ignored by students. And yeah. if you get uh, a personal message from a professor, that would be kind of more effective. I guess. Yeah. So no, so, <laughs> yeah, so here it comes to personalization, you know, and how much smart is we want to send this message. Of course, we will not let a system send the message by itself. I mean, even like starting from nothing, but at least how I see it is that we can develop a number of messages, like let's say 50 messages, and the system can send these messages to the students by some sort of individualization, like, hello, the name. Okay, then it feels there's something about the students, not like a bot, you know? And then we saw that your last activity, then it bought the day based on the number of this is how the system can take. So we try to, we will try, because you know, I have not yet developed, but we'll try to personalize the message to the best we can. But if the student is somehow too smart to, to see that the message is from a system and not from the teacher, yeah, that's the best we can do. And this is what yeah, the technology can offer for now, I think. Yeah. But I think this is an important point. Yeah. We are talking about students, so we assume that there is a level of human intelligence that is higher than the artificial intelligence or the technology that we currently have. And, and that means that they will understand rather sooner than later what is an automatic message and what is a personal message and they yeah. start ignoring the automatic message. Yeah, especially also Especially also, we are also discussing if the students should reply to these messages or not. And for now, we say the message is sent from the system and we say no reply email. <laughs> maybe that's, you know, maybe that's not, uh, that's a disadvantage that they say, okay, that appears to be a message from a system and not from a human. Okay. But, you know, it's just like this thing. We want to see whether it works or not. We saw that the, uh, the core signals, they, they see that. In the second week, the students found that uh, like their engagement, their performance has been improved because the messages have been sent from advisors. But yeah, what if like now the course will have 80 students? I mean, how can the teacher follow up on 80 students? That's very really hard. But we want to develop some messages and these messages will be sent as much personalized as possible. Yeah, so that's the best we can do. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Could I comment on that? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think this this idea of automating messages uh, seems to be a little bit going in the direction of trying to find a technical solution to what really is a social problem that we just don't have enough teachers or not enough funding to provide good uh, feedback to the students that we have. And then we're trying to paper over that by sort of technical solutions that never can really achieve the same interaction that you could have if you actually get a message from your lecturer. Yeah, so 
yeah, you know, is that it's also here we just like um, the classes is that the classes is between what a human can do and and the machine can do, and it's not only in this field but also extend to many other fields, right? Um, and we also get to the point that the teachers say, I don't have much time to uh, to follow up on homework for, for all my students. I have many other tasks to follow, and I need I need some help. And then maybe the machine can provide these kind of feedback. But I do agree with you is that the teacher by him or herself maybe would need help from researchers like us to help them to uh, maybe provide such feedback messages. And that also requires some funding, right? So I do agree with this. So hopefully maybe the government or the people who provide money can 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 can, can really see this. Especially is that what what I see is that some sort of so at some part of the world, like especially China, I can say that it's a lot of invest, it's a lot of invest on, on on such technology that appears to be something is working, and they might be really the, in the front, uh, like in the front, and much in the front than us. I would say it depends. What David said, and it depends on what your goal is with your message. If it's a student who is struggling and needs aid then the human connection between actually writing personal message to students is important. I don't believe a machine can do that, the technology we have today. But if it's a, a more, I have some technical issues with my software, I need some help. Those types of messages aren't as important that there's a, there's a human involved. They just need an answer to the technical question. That aspect, uh, in that area, you can also generate these things, I believe. But if it's a necessity of human connection, then well, then you need a human. Yeah. So we have another comment or question in the back first, and then mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, I think there's a lot of positive things about uh, an automated message. Also, it's unbiased, right? I and mean, in the future, I think maybe an AI could give a better answer than many professors. So let's say in 30 years from now, maybe AI knows more than any human. So yeah, I think it's a good, good uh, research area. I, I also have just a, another point related to this, and it's more about the maturity limitations to um, how specific uh, um, these, these messages can be currently, although probably, I mean, uh, taking into account, you know, for instance, the outcome of different test questions, they could be quite differentiated. But um, I also think there's um, one potential benefit can be that, well, in these types of messages, the way that they are formulated can be evidence-based and based on best uh, or the best knowledge that we have on how to exactly formulate that there, there are um, some well-known and very interesting facts, like for instance in behavioral uh, behavioral economics, where the specific wordings that can massively change how people, um, for example, comply with, 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 with certain measures that could very well be informed here, yeah, and that maybe not, or not all professors are equally good at giving that kind of feedback. There is a, there is a difference between, like, right, well, why haven't you uh, delivered? <laughs> and I don't know what's, what's best, or why, why haven't you delivered exercise one? Maybe there can be a wording that maximizes the uh, degree of compliance. In fact, these things are being studied in, 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 in other fields as well. Maybe one short comment to that. I think we should not forget about the third option, and that is to, to be transparent about our messages. <laughs> I think one possible problem that, that gets intertwined with the, the question whether or not the message is good is whether you should pretend to, to, to make something a personal message when it's not. So I think that causes some of the issues um, that, that could be avoided. And yeah. I guess a factual message that is transparent about how it was generated could be also appreciated. So I, I don't know, when is the deadline for my assignment? And then this is an automatic answer that the, the deadline is. I mean, that, that would be yeah, another option. And then even things that are clearly uh, um, automatically generated are not necessarily completely ignored. I mean, people, you know, when they from their Fitbits gets the message, well, wow, you're nearly there, uh, uh, just, you know, 2,000 steps more, 
up uh, and then you get the next batch. I mean, that works on, on many people. So it's not like it's, or yeah. it's completely no other if it's automated. It's also, it's also what I want to say about the core signal that shows the lights. Um, I don't know if that's very true or not, but I'm sure I talked to the person behind that tool and they told me the tool is not in use anymore. The, the problem is that, so now we've, we focus a lot on the automatic messages, but what about the reasons behind sending the automatic message or showing this line? It, this algorithm could be wrong. And, and uh, as you said, I don't know what they, your name? Hey. Healthy? Healthy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, okay. Is that, as you said, is that uh, we need to be transparent. We need to tell the users, the faculties, the anyone who's involved, all these stakeholders about these systems could go wrong, you know? And we, we can see uh, false predictions. Hmm? So, oh, this unit might fail, but yeah, I mean, it's all wrong, right? And then a feedback message is sent to that student and everything really is wrong, but the student, I mean, he has been like looking at the course from different area or from different machine and the system just realized he, he knew or she could fail but the system itself couldn't realize what's happening outside the machine right so yeah so translating was like also the the algorithms behind as it finds students at risk or sending feedback messages or performance could be wrong as well right? so that's also for Last question. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, how techni these techniques, as the messages or the signals thing, uh, would have to be uh, altered for uh, students with learning to be if I'm not for some, so that they're not. Uh, yeah, isolated. unfortunately, uh, uh, the proposal I sent to the NFR was about uh, students with disabilities and learning abilities, and all the messages that I got. Oh, this is this is a disadvantaged group, but they are very important. But your research is still not there. Or oh, you rely on your own findings to bring in this idea. And my idea was, was that okay, what about the students with disabilities who have problems with hearing and so and they are now pushed to the online systems during the COVID-19? And I really feel bad for them. Even the you know the regular people, they find some uh, you know anxiety problems. But what about the people who are who have uh, a few people behind them to help? The system itself is it's not really designed for a good accessibility. So what, what can we do about this? And that was my idea behind that project that was not really funded for several times that I said, but it's a very important area that I, I think it needs more attention. And that's why I put it to seven as that's one of the future aspects of learning analytics. The data to 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 that we understand from the data to help disadvantaged groups or students from like you know minorities. So this group of people are really also important. So we need to care for them as well. So, but for me, the answer is no. <laughs> for you, I thought I, I really have not designed the automatic message for this group of students. So. Okay. So I think in the interest of time, we need to stop the interesting discussion there. I would like to thank you so much again for accepting our invitation. <laughs>